Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's make a start. Thank you so much for coming. Chodesh Tov. Bezrat Hashem, it should be a Chodesh of Bracha and Besurot Tovot. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsorship for the 2024 academic year. The Shiram is sponsored Le'ilu Nishma Isprana Bas Branditz and Zelig Ben Kalman, Zichronim Livracha. It should be an Aliyah for their Neshamas and we're very grateful for the sponsorship. Now, we have a task ahead of us. If I could ask you to just turn off your phones, please. Um, I said last week that I was going to undertake this topic. Of course, this is, as I expected, it would become more and more center of the news. Um, it quickly became evident to me when I started preparing this, uh, this these are new shirim, I've not prepared these before, that you can't do this in one shir. Uh, this is going to have to be at least a two-part series, and it might have to be a three-part series. Uh, next week, therefore, I'm afraid we won't have to be able to talk about Purim, but I'm sure you'll manage to find a glass of wine without me. Um, and uh, the week after that is Purim, uh, and the week after that we may finish this series, if we don't get already onto Pesach, but we'll see. Let's make a start. There's a lot to say. I'd like to try and give as comprehensive a packet on this as I can. You'll see already today's sheet is 12 pages, so next time will be no less. Today's sources, quite a lot of them are in English, um, and I don't apologize for that because they were written in English. Uh, I'd like to quote quite extensively today from Rav Aaron Lichtenstein, Zechat Tzadik Livrocha, who I didn't have a personal kesha with, although many of his Talmidim are my Rebbeim. Um, there are a few issues to talk about when, first of all, is it the right temperature in here? No. It's going to get hot, isn't it? Okay, just let, let's, be, let's be aware of it. Maybe we should take, ask, ask, open a little window. Okay. Um, I'll leave you to decide if it gets too hot, if you could ask them to turn the air conditioning on. The, there are a few halachic issues to deal with here. As you well know, uh, the patur, uh, the, the uh, exemption from army service that is mostly, but not entirely, uh, given to the Haredi community, and I'm going to define these terms, we'll have to assume that we know who we're talking about, um, is something which is very strongly defended by many in that community. We heard the Sephardi uh, Chief Rabbi Rav Yosef talk about this in the last couple of days. And there are five or six different issues that come up in the sources to defend this current practice. Four of them are halachic, two or three of them are agadic. We will talk about one of the halachic issues today. Um, the halachic issues are basically what is a milchemet mitzvah and who has to go out and fight. That's number one. A second issue which we'll deal with next week is the Rambam has in his Mishneh Torah, which is a halachic work, at the end of Hilchot Shemitah, he has a piece that says that the Levian did not go out to fight because their job was holy work. They were of De Hashem in other areas. And just like the Levian were set aside for that holy purpose, anyone else in the Jewish people who decides to be part of Shevet Levi can become part of that holy group and they themselves will be free of the burdens of general society. That is often quoted as a, uh, as a source on this issue. And we'll have to look at that next week, together with another Rambam, who very clearly says that anyone who learns Torah all day and takes money for the community is committing a terrible Chilol Hashem. We'll have to put those two sources together and try and work out who he's talking about and how that applies, if, if at all, to the current situation. A third halachic issue is the statement which may be halachic, which, and it is applied halachically in certain areas, which says that Talmidi Chachamim do not need protection because their Torah protects them. We'll talk about that maybe next week as well. We have to talk about what that means, what are the parameters of that, does it mean it protects them, does it protect everyone else as well? We'll talk about that. And there's a, a, a very heavily tam, uh, halachic issue, which is Oisig ba mitzvah potam in a mitzvah. If I'm involved in one mitzvah, do I have to get pulled away to do another mitzvah, or do I continue in the mitzvah that I'm in? We won't be able to get into all the weeds of that, because it's a very highly complex topic, but we'll talk about it. And there are a few agadic statements as well, some of which we'll see today. Uh, it talks about Avram Avinu, who was punished, and we were punished by having to go to Mitzrayim and be slaves, 
because he recruited Talmidei Chachamim to fight his war against the four kings. We'll have to see what that means. Is that a halachic statement? Does that have application? And many more as well. But today we're going to, to really talk about something which is often not talked about, and I think this is a mistake, which is the Lachatchila stroke Bidi Eved situation of Hester. Meaning, whatever happens in terms of the way forward politically, it'll be some kind of Hezder arrangement that is done, a little bit like is done with the Datilumi Yeshivot, where there's a combination of learning and uh, military service. That's, I'm sure, what will be proposed. Uh, and I want to talk about Rav Lichtenstein's approach to Hezder, which we, I think we should keep in mind, rather than just getting swept into a bandwagon of Shivyon Banetel, uh, and we'll analyze what that might mean, um, we should look at maybe the Lechatchila side of it. I brought you on page one, which I'm not going to read now, because I'm sure you, many of you have looked at this before. The historical uh, background to the Petur, to the exemption for army service, starting in 1948 when Ben-Gurion agreed to give a, uh, a patura to around 400 senior scholars, Torah scholars, on the basis of Toroso Unoso, which is that their Torah is their whole life, their occupation, and he allowed that. Uh, he assumed that the problem would just go away as this old Eastern European model of the yeshiva, Haredi yeshiva bochrim, would eventually just die out. Um, that did not happen, Baruch Hashem. Um, and Menachem Begin, when he came in in 1977, removed what was then a cap on this, the number of exemptions, and the number of exemptions began to rise quickly, to the point that rather than 400 scholars being exempted today, the current number in 2023-24 is 66,784 exemptions. Now, I can't guarantee those numbers. They were taken from uh, research which was done by other agencies, but let's assume they're round, a roundabout correct. Um, over the last 25 years, the Supreme Court has got involved, saying this is not lawful because it's discriminatory uh, and requiring the Knesset to pa- pass laws. They passed in 2002 something called the Tau Law, which was designed to address this with a new system. Eventually, that was also struck down by the Supreme Court that said it didn't work. Um, and various coalitions over the last seven, eight, nine years, depending on who was in the coalition, have either passed more you know, progressive, as it were, legislation on this or uh, rolled it back. Until the point now, if you just go over the page, and again, I've given you more details, if you remember over the last five years we had four elections in five years or something like five elections in four years, something like that, nothing much got done. Um, the current draft extension that was in place under the current legislation expired on the, 20, on the 31st of July, 2023. The cabinet then ordered the defense minister... To, um, to delay conscription until March the 31st, 2024, which, of course, is coming very soon. But all of this happened before October the 7th. And then October the 7th happened, and everything changed. How it changed, we don't yet know. But that it changed, it definitely did. And change is coming, um, and how it will look, we'll have to see. What are our new military requirements? The army is saying we need way more people than we thought we needed a year ago. How, how does that work and what do we need them to do? What is public opinion? How is all the men and women who've been in Milouim over the last six to seven months, how will, or a bit less than that, but in a long time, how will their opinions, voting patterns change? The, how has the opinion of the religious Zionist community shifted on this issue, given their very heavily involvement heavy involvement in the war and many of the losses that have been suffered in the war. How will the new political alignments work? Uh, Will there be a change in the Haredi attitudes in the community? Where will that come from? Will it come from the leadership? Will it come from the grassroots? Or everything will change. And there will be some people, like when you smash a plate that you live in denial and you try and glue it together and hold it with rubber bands and pretend that somehow or other you can still have the plate that you used to have. But then at a certain point you realize, no, I'm sorry, it's now there's a new system, there's a new paradigm, and who exactly will bring that in and how it will work remains to be seen. But let, let's just take a little bit of a, a historical look to start with. It's important to remember that at the beginning of the state in 1948, There were many strong positions against recruitment of yeshiva, bochrim, and Torah scholars from within the religious Zionist community as well. And I brought you two quotes here, one from Rav Moshe Kharlap, who of course was the Rosh Hashiva of Merkaz Arav, 
1948, and one from Rav Issa Zalman Meltzer. Rav Issa Zalman Meltzer was not one of the extremists in the old Yeshuv in the 1940s. He was one of the middle ground, as it was seen. Let's have a look at Rav Chalap, number one. This is our view. Da'at Torah. This is the view of the Torah. Da'at Torah. Shekol ben yeshiva yeda et tavkido hana'eman. Every yeshiva boy should know his actual unit is liyot b'chel Hashem. Chel Hashem. You are military fighters in the Chel Hashem learning in yeshiva. Ve'ein alav shum chova lehityatzev. You have no obligation to sign up. Lehavkid. Liyot Hashem. You don't have any obligation to feel that you need to be in any other unit. You are in Chel Hashem. Now, in that short quote, he doesn't say you're not allowed to, but he makes it clear that the, the role of Yeshiva Bachrim, which again was a small group in the 1940s, was in Chel Hashem. However, Rabbi Issa Zalman came out more strongly about, against this. Look at number two. I want to make this absolutely clear to all those who are learning the Bata Midrash. According to the Holy Torah, the terrible state in which we find ourselves in the independence war in 48. He rak b'schut Torah takedosha. The the hatsala, the 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 ability to to be saved from that is only in the schut of the Torah. And you can see, therefore, the comments that people make today are in in a in a in a, in a masora, if you like, of these comments. And again, I'm bringing you Rav Melsa. I'm not bringing you uh, someone from an extreme position in the in the Yeshua Yeshua. All the time that the voice of Yaakov is in the Batiknesiot, then the hands of Esav will not be able to succeed. Now, don't forget, the people, Rabbi Issa Zalman knows full well the horrors of the Holocaust. He's, coming, he's not living in a naive universe. They're living just a couple of years after all of the Yeshiva Bochrim in Eastern Europe and the Yeshivat and the communities were completely wiped out. By the Nazis, so he's not living in in a naive universe. And I'm giving out a das Torah as a clear halacha. He goes further than Rav Chalap in the quote that I brought. He must not sign up. Not even for shmira. The Ezel not even to help shmira. meaning even when it comes to just standing a post. Locally with a gun to make sure for a few hours a day that nobody's attacking. You can't do that either. Forget about joining the army for years. You can't even do shmirah. And God forbid we should even doubt this. So we certainly shouldn't enter into agreements and look for ways out. Today the Bnei Yeshiva have an even bigger obligation because there's a war on. Right now, you have to learn even harder, learn even more. And this will give a shmira to all the Jewish people. Okay, very clear. Now it's interesting. I heard from Rav Zay Weitman. Uh, Var Weitman is the, the uh, Rav Machshir of Tznuva and also the Rav of, uh, of uh, Alon Shvut, my Yishuv, and a very senior Talmud Chacham, that he heard from Rav Amital, Rav Yehuda Amital, who was the founding Rosh Hashiva of Haritz on the Gush. Um, Rav Amital was a Talmud of Rav Issa Zalman Meltzer. And Rav Amital received smicha from Rav Issa Zalman Meltzer. And Rav Amital married the granddaughter of Rav Issa Zalman Meltzer. And at the time when he'd done all of those things, uh, Rav Amital told Rav Weitman, who I heard from Rav Weitman, that he walked into a shir that Rav Issa Zalman Meltzer was giving. In 1948, Rav Amital was a, a, a Holocaust survivor. He came over, he fought in the Haganah, he joined the Haganah. He was involved in very active service in 1948. He walked in in his madim, in his army uniform, to Rav Issa Zalman's shir. And Rav Issa Zalman turned around to his students and said, We sit and learn Hilchas Milchama in the Rambam. But Yehuda, he lives it. 
How do you, how do you square the two? You, there's a number of different ways to square them, and I'm not going to go into that now. But that's a family story from the Amital family and the, uh, and the, uh, and the family of Issa Zalman. But nevertheless, he came out with a clear written pronunciation against it. In contrast to that, and I want you just to turn to the back page for a second, the appendix. Rav Shalom, Rav Shalom Yosef Zevin. Rav Zevin, who was, of course, one of the founding uh, fathers of the Encyclopedia Talmudit project, very much part of that. It's the front of the last page. Oh, the front of the last page? Excuse me, page 11, thank you. Um, Rav Zevin issued, in writing, a very clear piece which opposed the positions of Rav Chalap, of Rav Issa Zalman, and said it's absolutely essential that there is a yeshiva draft. Now, other people that we'll see in a minute who were very much in favor of that were Rav Svi Yehuda Kuk uh, and Rav uh, Dovita Nazir, one of the students of Rav Kuk, and we'll see what Rav Kuk has to say about that in a minute. But originally, Rav Zevin didn't publish this under his own name. He, he, he published it under the Echad Mea Rabbanim. Maybe it was just too hot to handle but look, look at what he says. This was translated, uh, and it's from a tradition journal. It was translated, I put it here earlier on in the sheet. The details are where you can find it. So he says as follows. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but let's read a few bits of it. The deepest respect and admiration is due to the rabbis and learned scholars of our holy city. But the question may nonetheless be asked. Teachers, our masters, how can this be justified? What is the source for exempting yeshiva students and terrorist scholars from an obligatory war? Bilhamid Mitzvah, we'll see what that is in a minute fought to defend Israel from those who come to destroy her, God forbid. How can you pass it off as if it was halacha or das Torah? Now, das Torah is a little bit manipulative. When you say the word das Torah, people feel that, you know, that everyone agrees on this. The yeshiva students need not register or serve. Have we not learned that when it comes to saving a life, not many lives, just one? These things are done by the leaders of Israel. Pikuach Nefesh is done by Gedole Israel, by the scholars, in order to teach the halacha to the nation. He's saying, Dafka the Yeshiva Bokhrim should be fighting in the army. Dafka. Was any distinction made whether or not it's time of learning Torah that is to be lost? If this is the case in saving one life, how much more so in the saving tens of thousands of Jews? Now, perhaps a distinction should be made as to whether one must endanger himself in order to save someone else's life. Could we go so far as to say that if one's own life were threatened, he has no obligation to save other people? If so, where does the Torah differentiate between the self-sacrifice of the highest of the high and that of the lowest of the low? If a person should not have been drafted because of the danger involved, all of Israel is exempt. Why have you excused only the yeshiva students? How do you know that your bloader, blood is redder than that of your fellow man? Very strong statement. Well, what right do you have not to be part of the danger when everybody is in danger? How do you know that your blood is red, etc.? There's no distinction to be taken between the blood of a Torah scholar and that of a common man. The rule that one life is not pushed aside for another applies even to a day-old baby. It is clear that up to now there had never been any controversy as to whether the principle that one must put his own life in danger to save another is applied only to saving an individual's life, or perhaps the lives of many individuals. But there is certainly no disagreement when it comes to saving Klal Yisrael. Surely there is no need to review the unanimous opinion that a defensive war fought to save Israel against their enemies is an obligatory one, of which it's been said, all must go, even a bridegroom from the room and a bride from under her chuppah. How have we arrived at the conclusion that scholars are not included in the obligation? If our generation merited everyone studying Torah, let's imagine the whole of Eretz Israel. Everybody was involved in Talmud Torah. What oh, amazing thing. Would we allow our enemies to ravage our land and kill our people without taking up arms to defend ourselves? We were not worthy, but thank God that there are people ready to stand firm and fight. What source have we for a hierarchy of obligation regarding participating in a war to save Israel from its enemies? I'm just turn over the page. I'm just going to read one other uh, small paragraph. If you go on the right, on page 12, he says, I understand the feelings of Nituri Karta, who are unalterably opposed to the state of Israel. They oppose the war because they feel that we should surrender. Even according to these ideas, there's no difference between a yeshiva student and the common people. Meaning, they don't make a distinction between the yeshiva boys and the regular people. They just think everybody should surrender. Anyone who subscribes to this philosophy must be against the conscription of anyone in Israel, whoever he would be. Luckily, very few people feel this way. 
Our entire nation in Israel and in the diaspora eagerly risk their lives in this defensive war which has been thrust upon us. They understand well that there is no future for the yeshiva, for the yeshuv, here or for the refugees waiting in the diaspora without our own independent country. One that would be open to accept our bloody brothers who wander in the burning, wander in the burning gullet. God, Israel, and the rest of the world know that we are not the aggressors. We do not want war. We are not gladdened by the spilling of blood. But if our enemies fall upon us in a mad, killing frenzy, we must defend ourselves. And you, he's addressing the Rabbanim, our Gaonim, admit the dire necessity of this obligatory war. Many of you have sent blessings and words of encouragement to our valiant soldiers. It is your obligation to encourage young and healthy scholars to fight. Will you send your brothers to war and yourselves sit at home? Which is a posik from Moshe Rabbeinu. When the Bnei Gad and the Bnei Reuven will see that posik inside, say, you know something, we're just happy to stay over here. He looks at them incredulous and said, now that we fought for your land, you're going to stay at home while the rest of Klan Israel fight? And you're not going to fight with them? How can that be? Anyway, Rav Zevin's piece, you can read the rest on your own. It, it makes very important reading. But you should know, even in the earliest days of the Yeshuv, this was a, a significant issue. Rav Herzog, the chief rabbi at the time, was very in favor uh, of the Yeshiva students being draft, drafted. But then when the government suggested withholding food supplies to Yeshiva students who wouldn't draft, he said, you can't do that. You can't starve people to force them to draft. And that, of course, is likely to be one of the discussions on the table as to, well, are we going to cut down the, uh, the payments that we make to families in order to incentivize them to draft? And Rav Herzog said, no matter how important drafting is, starving families is not the way necessarily to do it. And again, I'm not making any personal comment on what we should or shouldn't do. It's, there's no comparison. Because these people are literally starving. Yes, you're right, 100%. There's no comparison. You're right. Correct. 100%. And distributed. That's absolutely correct. It's a different situation. They never, but no two situations are ever exactly the same. No, no. You're right. But there are 100% people who are literally starving. Today, people are not literally starving. But also, you know, today our standards of living are not what they were in the 1940s. And what people could live with in the 40s, people may not be able to live with today. Anyway, I brought you, and again, please don't, anything I say should not be interpreted, whichever way I say it, as my own personal opinion. <laughs> You know, if you want my personal opinion, you can ask me personally. I'm not interested in putting it onto a, uh, a shear which we broadcast around the world. Um, I brought you on page three, and I'm not going to read this. Uh, Rav Shai Yishuv Cohen, who, of course, some of you in this room may have known him personally, um, who was the son of Rav David Hanazir and was a student at Merkaz Arav. And he was uh, confronted. He was signed up to fight. And he was confronted with a slogan on the wall that Rav Kook, Rav Avraham, Yitzchak, Akoin Kook, himself, said that he was not allowed for Yeshiva Bokram to fight. And he ran through the streets. He couldn't believe it. And he saw Rav Tzvi Yehudi. He bumped into Rav Tzvi Yehudi Kook. And he said, is this true? Is it true that your father said also that Yeshiva Bokram should never be drafted? Um, and Rav, uh, if you look here at the last two paragraphs, under the pressure of his questioning, I told him about organizing a fighting yeshiva in the Jewish quarter, and my distress when I saw the announcements which indicated that we were acting against the guidance of Rav Kook. When he heard my words, Rav Tzvi Yehuda was horrified. He grabbed me by my shoulders and began to roar, this is a complete forgery, a distortion, an utter falsehood. He was so upset, his shouts echoed down the street. After calming down, he explained that his father had written the letter during the First World War regarding the draft of yeshiva students who'd escaped from Russia to England. Rav Cook felt that these students should be exempted from the draft, just as the British <coughs> exempted other clergy students. But here, Rav Tzvi Yehudi continued with emotion, here we are fighting for our hold on the land of Israel and the holy city of Yerushalayim. This is undoubtedly a milchamit mitzvah, whereas in England the demand was yeshiva students should fight for a foreign army. Now, I actually brought you an extract from Rav Cook's letter in number four to Rav Hertz, the chief rabbi of Britain and the Com and uh, sorry the British Empire I should say nearly said the Commonwealth by mistake um, the British Empire at the time and uh, Rav, Rav Cook wrote to Rav Hertz encouraging him uh, begging him to intercede to prevent the draft of yeshiva students from London into the British Army um, one of the things he says there which we'll have to come back to. Um, one second, so I'll make sure this is still going. Yeah, one of the things he says there, just underlined in number four, he brings different gemarots, 
One of which is that Avram Avinu was criticized, as I mentioned before, for recruiting Talmide Chachamim to fight the war against the four kings. And again, we're going to have to unpack that. What does that mean? What, was it, is that a gadot? It is an a gadot, so how do we understand that? But if you look at what Rav Kook does say there, he says, underline, V'yotel mizera inu. At Gedulat Isur, we've seen how great is the prohibition La Asot Angaria to make a draft of Tamide Chachamim the Kaifan Al Yitzia Le Milchama to force them to go out to war. Afilu Al Milchemet Mitzvah Gedola Maod. Even for a very very big Milchemet Mitzvah, Yeshiva students mustn't go out to war. It doesn't say Yeshiva students. It says Tamide. Oh, very nice. <laughs> I, I accept your co- correction. It's a very accurate one. He says, Tell me chachamim. And that is a point that we will need to address. And Rav Aaron Lichtenstein will address that next week when we see his piece response to this tribe of Levi argument. And we say, Who does this actually apply to? That's an excellent point. But we have to work out what to do with Rav Cook. Rav Cook was writing in England in 1917, 1916, 1917. What would Rav Cook have said? in 1948 in defending Eretz Israel. So Rav Tzvi Yehuda, his son, is no question. He said this was, this was for then, and now he would not say anything like this. Yes, sir? No, he's talking about Avram Avinu. When Avram Avinu was fighting, because that's the next line, I didn't read the next line, he's not saying the World War I is a Milchamit Mitzvah. In case you're asking that. Although, he did have a lot to say about World War I, which we're not going to talk about now. So, just introducing those different voices, you can see there is a certain fog of war, even in the opinions about war. Um, And that is uh, the nature of things. And people are always going to bring the quotes from people they wish to support them, uh, even if those quotes have to be examined more carefully as to what was their context. Let's have a look at a, a fundamental question which we need to, uh, uh, which I want to bring in Rav Aaron Lichtenstein to talk about. Is the army a good place for a yeshiva bocha? And here I do mean a yeshiva bocha. Yeah. The guys they're drafting in from yeshivas, 18, 19, these are young men, they learn Torah, they're not uh, fighters. Do we say that this should be a place for them? So let's have a look. Uh, if you look in Shmuel, uh, Shmuel Bet, at the end, at number five, there's a posse in Shmuel Bet that goes through the different fighting uh, personalities in David Amalek's army. The David. These are the names of David's, you know, uh, valorous, uh, glorious men. Yoshei B'Shevet Tach Komoni Rosh HaShlishi. There's a debate as to whether that's the name of a person, Yoshei B'Shevet, or sitting in the, with the wise, the, the, the Rosh HaShlishi, which is the head of a part of the army. You can look in the different uh, parashanim there. Uh, who is this person? Who Adino HaEtzni? This fellow Adino HaEtzni, who was famous for what? Al Shmonim HaOt Chalal He took down 800 warriors with one, sort, with one arrow. Okay, who is this fellow? Um, Adino HaEtzni. So if you go over the page to page four, Chazal take this to be a reference to David HaMelech himself. And rather than reading this as a, a, a list in the chat of the different generals, all these expressions are about David. So look at what it says in number six from Moed Katan. My Ka'ama, what's being said here? This is what it's saying. The Eilish Shmot Gvuratav Shel David. This is how we praise David. This is what we look up to in David himself. Who Adino HaEtzni? He is the Adin, and yet he's the Etzni. When he was sitting and learning Torah, he was as soft and gentle as a worm. You could have just pressed him and exploded. He was a yeshiva bocha in learning Torah. But when he had to take off his whatever, Torah clothes, and put on his army clothes, he was as strong as a wood. And he talks about the 800 people that he would kill. He would, th- he would th- uh, shoot an arrow. And he would take down 800. And he would regret he can get the other 200. And he brings that from a posik as well. In other words, Chazal, Chazal see in the personality of David himself, not a yeshiva bocha, or a fighter, but both. He was both, and he was both with extreme success. And that was an ideal. 
Um, Mashiach himself, if we look in number seven, Rambam says in Yamot Melech for Beis David, how do we know it's going to be Mashiach? Chogeb Torah has to be very learned in Torah. V'osek b'mitzvot k'David David again like David. K'fi Torah b'chta she b'chta v'bal peh v'yilcham milchamot Hashem, and he also needs to be a warrior. Now, you could turn around and say, Milchomot Hashem may mean spiritual wars. And of course, the Lubavitch Rebbe took this idea to its next stage. And, and the, what is the youth group of Chabad little boys? I don't know if they've got girls as well, probably have in Chabad. Siva Hashem, the armies of Hashem. So Milchomot Hashem may, may not be, as on some views, literal. But the Rambam, I think, clearly is seeing it as an actual battle. Uh, there's a model of a Mashiach who is a Lomed Torah and also a Gibor Chayab. Um, look in the Ramban in number eight, I'll mention it outside. The Ramban says, why was Abimelech so keen to make a treaty with, with Avraham and Yitzchak? He says, because they were Giburei Chayal. He'd seen what they could do. He'd seen how Avraham had smashed the four kings. He was nothing compared to the four kings. And therefore, the personality the Ramban is telling us of Avraham and Yitzchak that the Torah is presenting is not only all the other things we always learn about Avraham and Yitzchak, their spiritual sensitivities and the Akeda, etc., but also their ability to be Gibor Echaya. And the Ramban wants us to know that and understand that this is the Jewish way. And therefore, Rav Lichtenstein, for who we're going to give over the next 10 minutes or so of the Shia to, Rav Lichtenstein says, number nine, although stateless centuries have tended to obscure this fact, Hezda has been the traditional Jewish way. What were the milieu of Moshe Rabbeinu? Someone's phone is. Really it may be outside. We well, won't ring for long. I think, I, think, I think we just have to ignore it. Okay? Because otherwise we'll be searching everybody's backs for the phone. Although state centuries have tended to obscure this fact, Hezda has been the traditional Jewish way. What would the milieu of Moshe Rabbeinu, Yeshua, David, Rabbi Akiva, as Chazal conceived and described them, but Yeshivot Hezda? Rabbi Akiva had a, had a Hezda Yeshiva. They were fighting the war of Bar Kokhba and they were learning Torah. And therefore, what I want to, to talk to you about for the next few minutes is this idea of Hezdel. Um, and some important points that Rabbi Lichtenstein brings out, because we often get swept up into the, to the secular narrative of Shivyon Banetel, but actually that is not a perspective that the religious Zionist community supports, this idea. And we'll see, in a sense, why that is. There is an idea of a lechatchila in a Bidiyavid situation. I remember when our son joined, uh, went into Hezda, he went to the Haaretzion, Rav Lichtenstein Shiva, and when, when they called all the parents in for the, you know, your son's going into Hezda, I think Rav Moshe Lichtenstein said, this is a lechatchila solution to a bidiyevet situation. And there is a lechatchila element to this, which we need to understand. Look at number 10. Optimally, Hezda doesn't merely provide a religious cocoon for young men, fearful of being contaminated by the potentially secularizing influences of general army life, although it incidentally serves this need as well. Hezda, at its finest, seeks to attract and develop B'nai Torah who are profoundly motivated by the desire to become serious to Chachamim, but who concurrently feel morally and religiously bound to help defend their people and their country, who, given the historical exigencies of their time and place, regard this dual commitment as both a privilege and a duty who in comparison with their non hezda confrère, love not, to paraphrase Byron's child Harold, Torah less, but Israel more. I, I can't resist. I could read this all day, honestly. <laughs> I, 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 was, I was shocked to find that on a website, Rav Lichtenstein's article, Rav Lichtenstein's article had been printed out, had been brought down, but they'd been dumbed down. It had taken out a lot of the you know, expressions that he uses. You, you read Rav Lichtenstein not just for the content, but also for the style, mainly for the content. It provides a context within which students can focus upon enhancing their personal, spiritual, and intellectual growth, while yet heeding the call to public service, and it thus enables them to maintain an integrated Jewish essence. Now, again, this is going to be a hard sell to the Haredi community, but they don't know this Torah. They haven't learned this Torah. They haven't thought this through in this way. And of course, this is a religious Zionist manifesto in the sense that it seeks to balance things as a Jew in the modern world. And he sees in this sense the idea of army service not as kind of schlepping you away from Torah to do something else, but to actually take you from Torah to enhance your Jewish religious personality in a certain way. Number 11. When the Mishnah states if there's no flower, there's no Torah, and if there's no Torah, there's no flower, it hardly means that both are equally important. <coughs> Let's not lose sight of it now. 
What it does mean is that both are in fact equally necessary, although axiologically and teleologically, flower exists for the sake of Torah and not vice versa. Il faut manger pour vivre. Il ne faut pas vivre pour manger. Okay? Which he translates. You don't live to eat, you eat to live. He claims one of Molière's characters. And so it is with the Hester. The yeshiva prescribes military service as a means to an end, and that end is the enrichment of personal and communal spiritual life. The realization of the great moral and religious version, and maybe it should mean vision, whose fulfillment is our national destiny, and everything else is wholly subservient. No one responsibly connected with any yeshiva at Hesda advocates military service per se. We avoid even the slightest tinge of militarism. No less than every Jew, the typical Hesdanic yearns for peace, longs for the day on which he can divest himself of his uniform and Uzi and devote, they don't have an Uzi anymore, but you know what I mean, and devote his energies to Torah. In the interim, however, he harbors no illusions. He keeps his powder dry and his musket ready. <laughs> Rav Lichtenstein lives in the 17th century in his mind. <laughs> okay? In terms of his uh, process, mind process. Um, Go over to page five. Again, I make no apology for reading some of this out quickly, but it's important. And this next piece is very important, number 12. In one sense, therefore, insofar as an army service is alien to the ideal Jewish vision, Hesda is grounded in necessity rather than choice. If you wish, Bediyevet, it is, if you wish, a Bediyevet, a post facto response to a political reality imposed upon us by our enemies. In another sense, however, it is very much like Hatchila a freely willed option grounded in moral and halachic decision. We at Yeshiva Karetzion, at any rate, do not advocate Hezdel as a second best alternative for those unable or unwilling to accept the rigors of single-minded Torah study. We advocate it because we are convinced that given our circumstances, would that they were better, military service is a mitzvah, and a most important one of that. Without impugning the patriotism or ethical posture of those who think otherwise, we feel that for the overwhelming majority of B'nai Torah, defense is a moral imperative. Of course, that concern must be balanced against others. Knesset Yisrael needs not only security, but spirituality, and ultimately the former for the sake of the latter. Spirituality is more important. Those who, by dint of knowledge and inspiration, are able to preserve and enrich our moral vision and spiritual heritage contribute incalculably to the quality of our national life. And this must be considered in determining personal and collective priorities. Hence, while we of Yeshivat has the feel that training and subsequent reserve status for men should be virtually universal, spiritual specialization being reserved at most for the truly elite cadre, and that's the point that you made over there, the length of post-training service should be justifiably briefer than that of those unable or unwilling to make a comparable spiritual contribution. Now, what did he say there? Very important. Before you jump into the Shivyon Banetel issue, think about the meaning of those two words. First of all, he doesn't address this here, he addressed it before. What does Shivyon Banetel mean? Equality of burden. Now, as religious Jews, to call army service in the IDF a burden is unacceptable. It's an obligation, a duty, a responsibility, a challenge, maybe even opportunity, but a burden? A burden as if it's like taking out the garbage? That's an unacceptable word for us to use. Nettle, a burden. We don't see it as a burden. We wish we didn't have to do it. But now that we have to do it, it's an opportunity and a duty and an obligation. It's a very different kind of, kind of mindset. Uh, and what about Shiva Yon? We, we, are we in, in favor of equality? The problem with equality is you can't have a fair system if everybody is equal. And I'll tell you what I mean. Um, we don't have equality of army service. Men serve longer than women. Men serve for three years, roughly. Women serve for two years. Why is there no equality there? So you say, no, no, of course. I mean, that's, there are obvious reasons why women have to serve less. I don't know, are there obvious reasons? Are there other considerations? What about um, many of the people in this room, I'm sure, have children, grandchildren, young women who did shirut lomi. Chiloni, non-religious Israeli girls do not get a choice to do shirut lomi. They have to go to the army. And if they say, I'd rather do shirut lomi, they're told, well, I'm sorry, you're not dati, you can't do it. Now, there's no equality there. If you are pushing for equality, then very soon you'll be told, well, all your girls have to also join the army, and Shalut Lumi is not an acceptable option. Why should this daughter have to fight 
or do whatever she does in the army, and this daughter do something else. Now, you could say, well, shiruch l'mi is critically important, and I'm not denying that. But shivion is a dangerous word. And Rav, uh, Rav Lichtenstein also referred to this in terms of the Hezdi yeshivas. Many of your sons, grandsons, my son, went to a Hezdi yeshiva. So in a Hezdi, we're very proud of the boys in a Hezdi yeshiva, but they don't serve for three years. And they won't serve for three years. Because as Rav Lichtenstein says, what they do in the yeshivat is also important. There's no equality there. If we fly the banner of shivion then very soon that banner will be applied in ways that a lot of people will find unacceptable. So we just have to be a little bit careful as to how we apply equality, because equality is, a, as we saw after the French Revolution, uh, equal, I'm not saying it's going to be exactly the same, we're not going to bring back a guillotine, but uh, equality is a, uh, is a difficult thing, uh, and not a fair one either. So just, just want to mention that. I would prefer a different expression, not shivyon menetel, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, something bechova, or uh, tzedek bechova, I don't know. No one's asking my opinion on that. But uh, I don't like shivyon menetel. Number 13, says Rav Lichtenstein, the case for Hezda rests then on simple assumptions. Firstly, during the formative post-secondary years, a Ben Torah should be firmly rooted in a preeminently Torah climate. This being crucially important both for his personal spiritual development and the future of a nation in critical need of broadly based spiritual commitment and moral leadership. Think about the, the, uh, the Mechinot. The boys who go, go to Mechina come out of Mechina after a year, sometimes two years, although I think they're cutting that back. Much more mature, much more able to, but it's not Shivyon, it's not equal. Not everybody is going to a Mechina. Second, the defense of Israel is an ethical and halachical imperative, halachic imperative because, uh, be it because, as we believe, the birth of the state was a momentous historical event and its preservation of great spiritual significance, or because even failing that the physical survival of its three million, and I've added in Blian Harad, now over seven million Jewish inhabitants is at stake. And third, in light of the country's current military needs, and these should be admittedly be reassessed periodically, yeshiva students should participate in its defense, etc., etc. Um, so, all of these are very important points. We could go on, and I'm just going to mention one more thing. He brings in a number 14. Um, service enables the religious community as a whole to avoid both the reality and the stigma of parasitism. He's very aware of this. There's a reality, and there's also a stigma. It helps build personal character on the one hand, open channels of public life on impact on the other, by producing potential leaders attuned to the pulse and experience of their countrymen. To be sure, the prospect of secular criticism should not routinely be the decisive factor in determining religious policy. We don't change our religious policy because the secular world jumps up and down and screams. Nevertheless, it cannot be totally ignored. Chazal, at any rate, did not regard Chilil Hashem and Kiddush Hashem lightly. And he's very conscious. And Rav Herzog also wrote, I brought you in the note at the bottom, although I didn't bring you the whole piece, in 1948, in favor of the yeshiva draft. And he said, because what will happen if the yeshiva men are not drafted, even if we feel that there is an enormous contribution that they're making through learning Torah, the secular world will not understand that. And there will be enormous chilo Hashem, and it will lead to a... Uh, God forbid a terrible rejection of Torah and a hatred of Torah amongst people that are, that are, that are Chiloni. And again, that can't be the only consideration. But to not bring it into the consideration is unacceptable. Rav Lichtenstein is trying to, trying to balance that. On page 6, and I want to get back into the Hebrew sources quickly, um, I brought you here um, in number 6, the, the Rav Lichtenstein deals with the dangers of eroding religious commitments in numbers 15 and 16. One of the main arguments that the Haredi community advances is that the army will be very, very bad for the religious observance, level, commitments, dedication of many of their boys. Now, you could turn around and say, well, I mean, that's the situation that you should have thought through and, and you're not you know, giving them enough understanding of why they want to be... Okay, that's fine, but that's a little bit like the fellow coming to the door collecting for his nine children who've got no money because they've got no jobs and me saying, well, you know, you should have thought about before you got that into that system. It's the system that's... Okay, the system is at fault, but that doesn't help this fellow when he's got no money and he is almost as much a victim of the system as everybody else. Nevertheless, uh, Rav Lichtenstein is, is very uh, keenly aware of the attrition and the... Uh, the uh, 
negativity that the army has on religious life. And it does. And, I've, and anyone who's had family in the army, for all that we support and want to be part of the, of the Kiddush Hashem of being in the army, it is, a, it is very draining. And it's not because they can't keep Shabbat. Uh, Shabbat, they have lots of post game in the army that are very clear on what they can do and can't do on Shabbat. And the army won't force them into to do things which are against halakha. Uh, and the, kit- the kitchens are glad kosher. Don't worry, it's the kosherest kitchen you ever ate in the army. Because if the mashkiach messes it up, he won't get fired. He'll get put in jail. So the kitchen's fine. And the Shabbos, it- the problem is that being in the army, and this was my experience, I was never in the army, just, you know, full disclosure. I came on Aliyah when I was in my mid-30s. When I asked them about the army, they smiled at me and they said, you want to help Israel? Maybe you join the Syrian army. <laughs> So I felt that sarcasm was not helpful in my aliyah process, but nevertheless, but my son, our son, Baruch Hashem, was in the army, and being in the army necessarily takes over every single cell in your brain. You have to be a small cog in a very big wheel. You have no time for broader thinking, for deeper thinking, and every minute that you're not busy doing what you have to do, you're exhausted and you just flop down on the floor. That's how it is. Now, I'm not saying it can be any other way, because that's how the army needs to train its and use its soldiers. But there's no room for that lifestyle, in that lifestyle for religious growth in the way that we you know, understand it. And therefore, it has to be uh, understood that it's very, very difficult to get that right. And Rav, and Rav, um, uh, Rav uh, Lichtenstein understands that. Just look at number 16. Let's skip number 15. Like all yeshivad, the yeshivad has the seeks to instill a love for Torah so profound and so pervasive as to render prot- uh, protracted detachment from it painful. And yet it demands precisely such an absence. <laughs> it is painful to join the army, but we demand it, he says. It advocates patriotic national service even at some cost to personal development, and yet prescribes that students serve considerably less than the non-yeshiva peers. These apparent antinomies are the result of the basic attempt to reconcile conflicting claims. And duties, by striking a particular balance, one which should produce an aspiring Talmud Chacham, who also serves rather than as a soldier who also learns, but one who perceives military... Sorry, I said that wrong. Who He, he produces a Talmud Chacham who also serves, rather than a soldier who also learns. One which perceives military service as a spiritual sacrifice. We don't want students to be indifferent to their loss but which proceeds to demand that sacrifice, one which encourages a Hesdenik to excel as a soldier while in the army, but prescribes his return to the Bermid Rash before that excellence is fully applied, or perhaps fully attained. And this is another side of the coin. You put a young man in an army, we talk about men for now, and, and they do really well in the army, and they, become, they excel in their service, and they're ready to sign on to be more, to do an opposite. And you say, them, nope, back to the Bermid Rash. So in a sense, you're cutting them back from excelling even in their army service, which many boys will find difficult too. From the yeshiva's perspectives, these antitheses are fully justified, and they they constitute the very essence of Hesda as a complex and sensitive balance. However, preserving that balance with its multiple subtle nuances entails traversing a narrow ridge, and here lies the primary difficulty, existential and not just practical of Hester. Small wonder that many only achieve the balance imperfectly. It is, however, in those who do succeed in attaining the balance and who, despite the difficulty, are genuinely at peace with themselves, that Hester at its finest can be seen. And it is inspiring to behold. And in this, Rav Lichtenstein unquestionably is coming from his background in Yeshiva University. Because don't forget why you also walks a very narrow bridge and that world of centrist orthodoxy, which is a different bridge. It's not a bridge of religious Zionism, it's a bridge of modern orthodoxy or centrist orthodoxy, which also tries to balance two very important things in a way which will, of necessity, sometimes have casualties. And some people will not do them properly and will fall along the wayside. You know, Rabbi Nachman said it, everything is a geshet sarma'od. And you, can't, you have no choice but to wash down the Geshe Sama Od, because the, the alternative is a, is a world of pretense and denial, that you don't live in conflict. And Rav Soloveitchik actually has a piece which I didn't bring you, we could have gone on forever today, um, but we won't go on forever, um, where Rav Soloveitchik talks about modern orthodoxy as, as two mountains, 
with a narrow bridge between them. There's the Torah and there's the Mada. And he brings from Shmuel Hanavi, who lived al Ramatayim on two mountains, not one. And he paints this picture of these Wayu Bochrim walking this narrow bridge between Torah and Mada and some falling off down into the ravine as they go. And he said, I have sleepless nights at the reality that people do sometimes stumble and don't succeed in this synthesis. But what can I do? I can't deny that that is the way we have to be. So Rav Rav Lichtenstein, of course, who was son-in-law of Rav who was the Rosh Yeshiva to be at Yeshiva University before he, much to the dismay and excitement of many in the 1970s before he made Aliyah, uh, and I don't know if that was, you know, expected. You can ask speak to people who are more in the YU frame. But he, he's coming from that. That religious Zionism is in itself this tense synthesis. Whenever you have a hyphenated hashkafa, it's always tricky. You know, it's easy just to be yeshivish. Whatever that means. Nobody, you know, whatever. Haredi. It's great. But once you're modern slash or, or dash orthodox or religious dash Zionist, you've introduced a tension, a dialectic, which, of course, if you're Rav Lichtenstein and Rav Soloveitchik, means you're actually living life, but which causes a lot of challenges. Anyway, enough of that for now. Let's get back into uh, some of the issues. Milchemit Mitzvah. For the next ten minutes, let's dive into these sources. What we don't get through today, I will bring you Be'ez Rosh Hashem next week. Um, we know that certain people are sent back. That's source number 17. Those people... Well, let's leave the posse. V'yasmur Shotrim... So the, 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 the soldiers, the, the, the officers go to speak to the people. They are new and they say, says the Torah. Anyone who is scared and weak-hearted, let him go home. And not undermine the morale of other people. What does that mean? Source number 18. It comes page 7. Says the Mishnah. Literally, anyone who is scared is sent home. He can't cope with the, with the terrors of war. What does he mean who is scared? It's scared of... He's scared of his Averus. He won't be able to succeed because he's not enough of a tzaddik. I'll give you two examples. He holds it's only Torah Averas, and the two he points out are two which you might hold to be slightly lesser or unusual or not standard Averas, not necessarily lesser, but a Kohen who marries a Grusha. That's the kind of person, says Rabbi Yossi, who has to go home. Even that level of Avera, he's not going to be able to fight properly. Now, says the Mishnah then, but Madhavar Murim, when are we sending people home? B'mechemet Rishut. But when it comes to a milchemet mitzvah, everybody has to go. Even the chatan and the kalah are slept away from the chupa, and, and we've seen in this war and in previous wars. Chatan and kalah who delayed their weddings, who were taken away the day after their weddings from the Sheva Brachot. I know personally many cases of this. And I brought you in the references here for a previous, one of the previous Gaza was uh, one of the Khatanim who was so badly injured, uh, only a day or two into his wedding. We need to even take the Khatan and the Kala away. Fine. A couple of things before we go on. The example of the Kohen marrying a Grusha, you see from here that the Kohenim were in the war. We're going to have a discussion next week about whether they called up the Kohenim. Well, this Mishnah sounds like they did call up the Kohenim because the Kohenim were some of the people who they sent home. If they were a naughty code. Okay? Fine. So we'll just remember that. How do we define a milchamet mitzvah? So there are a number of different ways to approach it. The, uh, the Gemara in Sotah says some things are clear. Milchamot Yoshua Lichvosh, the milchama of Yoshua to capture the land of Israel, Divrei Hakol Chova. Okay, that's definitely Chova. Let's assume that means the same as mitzvah. It's not so straightforward, but let's assume that. Milchamot Bedavid Ravacha, the Bedavid's wars to expand his kingdom, they weren't necessary for defensive purposes. That is Rishut. Okay, that livery I call Rishut. Ki pligi, but where there's a debate, is a war, Lemiute of De Kochavim, the law Lese Alayu. A war where we need to, to preemptively weaken an enemy so that they won't cause us trouble in the future. One view says this is a Milchamit Mitzvah, and one view says this is a Milchamit Rishut. But what about a war which is not to preemptively weaken, 
but to actually defend ourselves after attack. So there the Lecha Mishnah brings down, I brought you in the footnotes, there everybody agrees it's a Milchamek Mitzvah. It's a Milchamek Mitzvah. What could be more of a Milchamek Mitzvah than coming to the defense of Klan Yisrael? And in fact, the Rambam, uh, when he defines that, if you look in number 21... The king is only allowed to go out and fight without permission from the Sanhedrin, etc. In a Milcham Mitzvah. What is a Milcham Mitzvah? He gives three options. Milcham Shivat Amamim, the war of Yeshua against the seven nations. Okay, that's historical. Milcham Amalek, which we talked about two weeks ago, whether that is or isn't historical. And the third, the Ezra Yisrael Miyatzar Sheba Aleihem. Saving Jewish, the Jewish people from an enemy who has attacked them. So that's not preemptively weakening where there's a debate, but it's an enemy who has attacked them. So most opinions will understand that this, what we're in right now, is a Melchamit Mitzvah. I did bring you Rashi in number 20, who says that the only Melchamit Mitzvah was the one of Yoshua. And after that, there are no, there's no such thing as a milchamit mitzvah. You might hear that shita. Oh, we, there's no milchamit mitzvah anymore. That's difficult because the Mishnah talks about the distinction between different kinds of milchama, milchamit rishud, milchamit mitzvah. So if they're all over at the time of Yeshua, then what's it talking about? And again, we can go into the depths of uh, where Rashi is coming from, but the opinion of the Rambam is pretty much universal. I don't think you'll find in the Haredi community much argument as to whether we are or are not in a Mechabit Mitzvah. There may be some that say, well, Rashi said, okay. But the Rambam certainly says, and this seems to be muskam generally amongst pretty much everybody. There is a Rambam that says that you can't be a Mechabit Mitzvah without a Beis HaMikdash. It's a difficult Rambam. I brought it in number 24, but I'm not going to go into it now. Certainly, Rav Tzvi Yehuda, Rav Goren, no surprises, held that what we're in since 1948 and even before, is a Mechamit Mitzvah, and you can read 22 and 23 in your own time. I've actually looked at them before in one of the Chizuk sessions we had earlier in the year, when we were just after October 7th, uh, where Rav Shlomo Goren and Rav Tzvi Yehudakuk say, Mechamit Mitzvah, there are no exceptions. Everybody has to come, and it's an absolute duty. It's based on the Mitzvah. You may not stand by while others, other Jews specifically are suffering, um, and therefore they see it clearly as a Mechamit Mitzvah. Question is though, the Talmud Chachamim need to come, or not? So, what do we say about Chatan Vakala? Well, are they, is, that, is, is it Kal Vachome Talmud Chachamim? If we even have to take the, the Chatan Vakala, then of course we have to take the, the, you know, the Talmud Chachamim. Or do we say, no, the Chatan Vakala, then we'll take. But Talmud Chachamim is a different case altogether. You could read this in different ways. And actually, I brought you numbers from 25, the Keren Or. We had him last week. Uh, the Keren Or was, I think, 18th century, 19th century. He was the one that said that we can depose the king. Remember, if we don't like the king anymore? Well, not for now. That was last week. Says the Keren Or. Um, it absolutely includes the Talmud Chachamim. And the Sefer Or learns it as... A kalvachome from chatan v'kala. Meaning, how can you take a chatan v'kala away from the chuppah? If you even take then, you take everybody. You must take everybody. However, I brought you, and we'll probably have to end at number 29, but it's, uh, maybe just tack on the, the rest next time. We've, pretty, we've made very good progress, Baruch Hashem. But I want to read you three more sources. First of all, the Tzitz Eliezer. Also not seen as a quote-unquote extremist on many issues. He says very clearly in number 27, When they said in Sotah, That doesn't include the Tamechacham. We'll see him next time. That's a mistake that Asa made. We'll see Chazal talk about King Asa, that he did draft the Tamanich HaChamim and he shouldn't have done. So there are those that say no. However, I just want to leave you today with a, a very important topic. It could be there's something even bigger than a Melchamit Mitzvah. We've been arguing, do they have to come in a Melchamit Mitzvah, yes or no? But the Chazon Ish, the Chazon Ish, who of course had that famous meeting with Ben-Gurion, which we'll look at next week, 
where they talked about the issue of the draft, and the Chazanish was like, laid down the law, no way. The Chazanish himself writes in number 28, Nira, seems to me, the Had Tznan bin Melchemet Mitzvah, when it talks about Melchemet Mitzvah, it says, Afilu Chatan Mechedro, Lo Ayri, it is not talking about a situation, Bizman Shitzrichim La Ezratan, La Nitzachom HaMilchama, at a time when you need everybody to win the war. Does that pshita? Because it's absolutely obvious in that case. The bishvil pikuach nefesh, the hatzalat ha'am, kulum chayavim. Obviously, everybody has to come if we need everybody, or if we need another thousand or another ten thousand. So that's not even a discussion. The the chidush of the gemara is, and the mishnah is, even when they only need a specific number, you can take from the chatanim. But when you need everybody then everybody's needed. You have, everyone has to come. Which is an interesting question. What does that mean, everybody's needed? How many people do we need now? I don't know the answer to that. When the army say they need X more, I mean, how many more is there? What are the enemies that we will, God forbid, have to face? Right now we're fighting Hamas. Hezbollah are on the border. Iran is around. And of course, the enemy that is never discussed but is at the back of everybody's name, mind is, of course, Egypt. What's going to be with Egypt? So you're going to say, Egypt? Egypt are our friends. Well, open up the Tanakh and see how that works. <laughs> now, Baruch Hashem, we're happy for our friends. But you've got right on the border one of the most strongly armed armies in the world with American weaponry, building roads through the Sinai for tanks that only have one purpose for the Egyptians. Okay? So how many men do we need? I don't know. Ask the army. Um, and uh, in uh, Hilchot Medina, even Rav Waldenberg, who said, you don't call the Tavi Chachamim, and I want to leave you with this, says in number 29, If we go into a war, And there's a Pikuach Nefesh if we don't take from the rabbis, they absolutely have to go out to their brother's help. Your excuse for that, because it's after time. It's fine. Okay? Um, and therefore, just be careful when people are throwing sources around. The Tzitz Eliezer says, you can't draft the rabbis for a milchamet mitzvah. But he says, but if you need them, then that's even more than a milchamet mitzvah. And of course you draft the rabbis. So we have to work out what's on that south. Please God, it'll be much better than we think it is. But we have to be plan ahead. And at the end of that source, he says, of course, we only draft people who know how to use a weapon. So, and that's a very important point, which is if we're going to need people in a year, we can't call them up in a year when they've been sitting in yeshiva. We have to train them how to be fighters. So we have to actually plan ahead in this way. And, and this will be definitely part of the cheshbon. Anyway, to be continued, Bezrat Hashem. Have a good week. We'll continue next week.